This conference will now be recorded. Hi everyone, it's Janine again. I would like to welcome you to today's presentation put off by Pete Ramey, um, the author of Care and Rehabilitation of the Equine Foot, everybody's favorite book. Uh, today, Pete's going to go over understanding sinkers and hoof capsule rotation. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, so if you have any questions, please hold off and wait. Um, we'll get to them at the end so that we could keep a nice flow going. And Pete, whenever you're ready, we'd love for you to take over. Thank you so much for being here, Pete. You need to unmute yourself. So that means that you heard none of that? None of that. <laughs> you hear me now. Yes, you got to start over. Sorry, you're you're good. <laughs> okay, I was just adding on to the Q&A part. Um, for Q&A today, um, type your questions and Janine is going to consolidate them. And also stick to only questions about what we talk about today um it's basically going to be about reading the foot and 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 um and and seeing some of these situations in the field and the what to do about it we're going to cover tomorrow so questions about what to do with these cases we're going to cover tomorrow and then any general questions about other stuff wait till tomorrow so the the questions today please only stick to questions about what i cover today and the reason for that should be obvious because there's a lot of questions you might have that that i'll be able to cover i'm, I'm planning to cover anyway tomorrow and then i'll have the slides for it and be able to answer them more clearly so um um i think that's the only housekeeping thing uh, uh i'm horrified as you can see um I, I never get used to teaching. I'm always I'm always scared of it. Um, but teaching for PHCP is the worst to me because hey Janine. Yes. It says that my camera shows. Never mind, I'm just gonna change it to who's talking. No, it's on who's talking, but it says it's you. I see you. We. I only see you. Oh, I only see you. Aren't you lucky? It'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm always particularly horrified to teach to PACP because I, there's there's so many. Um, I really respect the knowledge of of, um, uh, of the PACP uh, members and and uh, in your education process i feel like i'm um telling you stuff you already know and and um uh, but my hope is is i also know that there's newer students here so what i'm trying to do as far as scope goes is is provide some important things that newer people that less experienced people need to know um, i'm hoping to give a few tidbits to the more experienced people and to those of you i know you're here that already know everything i'm presenting on um maybe i hopefully you know help with your ability to to teach this stuff yourself um, with that said i'll do the best i can for you um so uh, i want to talk about these these feet that i call the farrier trap and it's not just picking on the horseshoers um, um, I mean farriers, trimmers, um, veterinarians too, actually, um, that you take this foot, it looks so long, such a long heel, such a long toe, 
Um, most people walk up to this and when the foot's on the ground, think that there's going to be a tremendous amount of trimming work to do. Um, when you look at the radiograph, though, you see that the heel, the the this is somewhere between just the right amount of tissue uh, that we should see uh, between the internal structures and the outdoors uh, to maybe a little bit, not quite enough. Um, and then, of course, it's very, very thin um, as you move forward. So what makes this foot look so long? Um, um, well, at the toe, anyway, um, it's because we have a deep CE. Now, if this term is new to you, the CE is the measurement between the E is the extensor process, the top of the coffin bone. Um, the C is the coronet. And of course, in this one, I'm only estimating because we don't have a marker. The only way to turn CE into a measurable, um, trackable um, uh, number is if you have a, a radiopaque marker on the hoof um, that stops exactly at the base of the hair follicles. And when you have that, then you can, then you can, and a scale on your radiograph, of course, and then, then you can measure this and track it over time, see if it's getting worse or better. In this case, I've guessed it where it is, the vet, the cornet, the best that I can. And you can, it's a good digital radiograph, and you can see where the hair is in this one. Um, but, uh, but, but in all of the other radiographs that I'll use in this presentation, that has been marked this way, very precisely at the base of the hair follicles. So when a horse has a deep CE, people will call that a sinker. And I've called it a sinker here too. But the reason I put it in quotes is because I think that's a bit of a misnomer. Um, the, the, it complies that the coffin bone went somewhere. And the coffin bone didn't go anywhere. Um, the coffin bone and the rest of the skeleton is exactly where it's supposed to be. What's actually moved is the coronet. Um, that is vertically displaced up the limb. And, and, but either way, whichever way you want to look at it, um, it creates this long hoof capsule. And if you don't recognize this stuff that I'm talking about, it leads to a lot of very, very serious trimming mistakes. So the coronet is very, very untrustworthy, whether we're talking about using it for medial lateral balance, heel height, toe length, uh, because it is in a constant state of motion, it can move. So, so in this foot, you know, there may be a little bit of breakover work that would need to be done, but you know, that's it. Uh, uh, like I say, this thing is correct in the back of the foot. So I want to be sure that everyone watching this can read this situation and, um, and know they're looking at it. Uh, this other foot on the same horse, it illustrates this even worse. This looks like an even longer heel, an even longer toe. And, and, um, and when, in fact, if you look at the radiograph, there's just the tiniest, tiniest bit, um, maybe of excess length right here at the back of the foot. Another feature of these sinkers, if you want to call it that, is that the coronet is, is instead of being supported by the, 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 the coffin bone, is up here. And in this one, you've got um, almost all of the, of the second phalanx, the short pastern bone, buried in this hoof capsule. And this joint is flexing and can beat the, the, the coronet in the upper part of the hoof wall into a more vertical shape. So a lot of you may be programmed to look at this foot and, and, and use the upper growth. Uh-oh. Why? And use the upper growth to, to project down and think that we might have a correct foot like this. Okay, and if we didn't have such a deep CE, that might be viable to, to use that to an extent. But chopping off the coffin bone is a bad thing. We don't want to do that. Um, and even though I would really, even if the foot was here, I would never cut that line. I'll talk about why later. But, but it would create a misreading of the situation. So using this upper, upper growth, is a good indicator usually of what the foot the horse wants to grow but watch out and especially when you have a deep ce this can really trick you um so an indicator 
and we'll talk more about this later, is in this one, you'd want to look at the, the way the frog is in here, uh, more, more specifically, the, the collateral grooves along the side of the frog. If that was a case like this, like I've drawn, your frog would be, you'd be looking at as much or more foot out in front of the apex of the frog is behind it, and the frog and the, the collateral grooves will be stood up vertically. Whereas, in fact, the situation, the way it truly is, the radiograph shows us the frog's going to reach way out here forward um, in the foot and your collateral grooves, the frog is going to be laying at more of a natural angle. So, so that's why you know, we can never use this upper growth only in, in telling what the foot's going to do. Um, so again, look at this longer heel um, that we might walk up at first and think there's a tremendous amount of work to do. Actually, you know, this red line is, is really the most that I would see. And, you know, maybe a little bit of breakover work that, 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 that we could do to this foot today. So this was the most extreme uh, the case that I could find. Thank you, Alicia. Um, and and um, this is a more reasonable everyday case, although, you know, it's pretty severe too. Um, and I put these red dots on here. This is the coronet at the, at the, at the, at the back, at the front. Um, this one is at the heels. And in this case, a collateral groove depth was about um, um, uh, 20 millimeters or a little more than three quarters of an inch deep in the back and, and about a 10 millimeter deep um, collateral groove at the apex of the frog. I marked the front of the sole. And I mark, this is the lamellar wedge, it's the front of the foot. Um, and this is all lamellar wedge. I'll talk more about that later because the previous farrier, this was not me, but this was my first time I saw this horse. The previous farrier had um, thinned all this out so that the paper wall is paper thin at ground level. So I want to track this change over six months. And what's happened, I'm going to place this marker here. We're going to see how as I thicken the sole that, that, that this line moves up. But this line and this line are staying in the same place. All right, sorry, this are staying in the same place. Our lamellar wedge over time, as we grow in a better connected wall, is getting thinner. But then the big change, look at this, is how much that coronet moves. This is the same foot over a six month period. Now, this is a very important for you to understand what's going on here because on this day, there's going to be very little trimming for you to do. You know, a lot of breakover work, not much of anything else. Okay. But most people, your horse owner, often your veterinarian, um, um, all the whispering people at the, or at the, around at the boarding facility are all going to be saying, all right, this farrier doesn't know what they're doing. You know, he or she is leaving this foot too long. And so, um, even if you know better than to um, than to make the mistake of over trimming this foot because you have a a, a vertically displaced coronet, you're gonna have to constantly justify and educate everyone around this horse because you know until you've actually reversed and improved the CE, everyone that sees it is gonna be thinking that you're doing a lazy job and leaving this foot too long. Here's the radiograph on the same horse over the same period. Again, we see that we had almost all of P2 buried in the hoof capsule. And then over time, that we're improving the CE and growing in a better connected wall. And some of you may notice that even though I'm showing this as an excess case, and it was, this horse was very sound. We got a whole DVD set about this horse um, that, that, um, um, that a lot of times when you start with a deep sinker, that improving it some is the best that we can do. And we start off with a big rotation, improving it mostly is the best that we can do. Um, and that I think is because of internal, internal damage and changes that'll incur at the coronet with a case this bad. Um, and maybe it's that's just an excuse. Maybe um, I don't know enough yet. 
um, to, to improve a lot of these all the way. Another factor I want to talk about, I'm not quite ready. I don't, I doubt you could measure from the, um, the um, uh, top of the collateral cartilages. Um, I'll show you those later if that's new to you. Um, but in, in a horse with a healthy CE in the back of the foot, or it should be a CC, I guess, because we're talking about instead of measuring to the bone, we're measuring to the collateral cartilage. Um, that this, the top of the collateral cartilage is what gives this rounded look above the foot. So in a horse that hasn't sunk in the back of the foot, we'll see this nice round collateral cartilage sticking up above it. In our, in our, in our sinker cases or vertically displaced coronet, there will be little or no collateral cartilage sticking above it. So this is just a, um, another reminder um, um, on that. Excuse me a second. Janine, let me know if I'm good, if everybody can hear me. This is so weird sitting here teaching, and I don't know if you're even hearing me or not. We hear you. You're doing oh, great. Because <laughs> that's why I just looked at my phone. I got scared. Okay, I muted my phone. How would she let me know? So I yeah. just want to make sure that you are capable of yelling at me if you need to. Okay. Oh, good, good. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so... Um, back to the CE, what do we think is a natural CE? The, I don't know. The best I can tell, it's near zero. Um, we see this in, this is a stillborn foal. Um, and another feature I'll talk about a lot and that I've tracked over the last 10 years as digital radiographs have got more common out in us country podunk places, even amongst the the country vets, uh, almost everyone has gone digital now, um, that more and more commonly we can see where this point is right here in a good digital radiograph. And, and this, this, this proximal end of the hoof wall should reside right in this little notch in the base, right at the, as, as you come up the coffin bone, it rises up into a little hump of the extensor process. And that leaves a niche right here at the base where it looks to me like this niche should be. This being a stillborn foal. Um, and then the thickness of the corium here, um, of the dermal lamina and the coronary papilla being you know, somewhere around three, four millimeters thick, um, an eighth of an inch or a fat eight, eighth of an inch thick. Um, and you know, see this, this is my old uh, wild cadaver I, I found um, um, uh, stuck in the cattle gap. It's a teenage horse. Again, um, you know, we got this end of the hoof wall residing in that notch, okay? But also note how steep this hoof wall is here. Okay, and that gives us a near zero CE in this teenage horse, okay? But when we start talking about the deeper CEs, sometimes we'll see one, and this is a pretty deep sinker here, okay? We've got most of, of, um, um, of, of P2 buried in the hoof capsule, but if you look down here, um, the inner part of the hoof wall is, is right here in this niche that it should be. Okay, so what happened here? The only thing that has happened, well, there's a lot of things that happened, but is that this became steep and elongated and distorted, okay? This type, and we can see this on a good digital radiograph that we can see the proximal end of the hoof wall, well, this type tends to reverse very easily, very quickly, because we haven't really done as much true damage to the corium. Now, if you see, and I'll show you some radiographs, if you see this widen in this area of the hoof wall displaced vertically out of that notch at the base of the extensor process, um, then you'll come into horses that, that won't reverse or that will reverse very slowly, like three or four year plan, um, and, or will always keep some degree of pathology there. 
um, abscessing becomes more likely. Um, and that, again, I think that, that as we have forces taken off of the sole and frog and bars and excessive forces on the hoof wall, um, so that the, the coffin bone is moving down relative to the hoof wall, or more accurately, the hoof wall is moving up relative to the bone. I think at first this happens, that this distorts and it stretches and distorts. And finally it sinks so far that it pops loose and we get, now we get true damage here at the dermal lamina and the coronary papilla. Um, that, that they either will take a very, very long time to reverse or may be unreversible. Okay, so look at this on the inside. Um, it, it's uh, looking at that on the inside, see how long this hoof wall is. And a lot of people would think there's a lot of work to do on this foot. Um, well, when you peel it apart, um, you see that you have a good sole thickness here. Um, and what was actually happening, even this one, this was a, this was a wild foot too, but this one was jamming the coronet up a little bit. And soon as I pulled the hoof capsule off, the coronet relaxed down to a, to a more normal position. Um, so coming up and look at this long hoof capsule, um, and it caused me to thin this sole out, um, again, you know, would have been a really big mistake in my book, um, which my book doesn't matter. It's actually in the horse's book that that is a big mistake. And so that's one of the big things. A lot of people are still saying that reversing a sinker is impossible, um, but, you know, and they need to realize just how flexible that the coronet, the, the, the coronet is. Um, this is this is highly mobile um, and probably is supposed to be flexing up and down as a part of energy dissipation, uh, um, you know, as a part of normal stride, um, this constant moving up and down. So it becomes, th this becomes a very, very unreliable place to measure from. And it's amazing because we have so many people out there that are teaching uh, to measure heel height or toe length to certain measurements from the coronet or to um, trust the balance at the coronet because um, of the location of the hairline and you know this 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 um, is moving around um, and is is one of the least reliable uh, ways that we consider hoof length in my opinion. So what is reliable? What is our goal? Um, well it's much harder to do but we need to consider hoof length um, from the bottom of the corium, from the bottom of, of uh, so in other words, sole thickness, the thickness of the, the skin of the frog, the thickness of the bars um, of material. Um, all these are, are lengths or thicknesses of armor from the corium. And, and this is where we need to consider hoof length, the length of heel height, um, of, of, of toe length, uh, you know, every aspect and of medial lateral balance. And then we need to think of the location of the hairline as, a, as a probably important, but entirely separate factor from our hoof balance. And so I believe that we need this, this 12 to 15 millimeter or, you know, half inch to five eighths of an inch thickness of skin of the frog bars and sole, um, regardless of whether we're protecting the foot from the ground, from a boot, or from a shoe. And the from a shoe thing becomes very important because it's a lot more common for barefoot practitioners to um, appreciate the need for this thickness. Um, necessity does that to us, right? Um, but then, um, uh, farriers, horseshoers, typically, it's routine. They think it's okay to remove um, the sole and this this length from the coffin bone down because they're replacing that thickness with the shoe. And what I find is that the, the, that thinking is causing a lot of the pain, abscessing, bone remodeling, um, bone loss that we see from back to back to back shoeing uh, that I find is not really 
a fault of the shoe itself as much as it is um, this thinning out of the the, the bar soles and frog um, in preparation for the shoe. So again, just just something here that I'm I'm wanting whether I'm shoeing, booting, or barefoot. I'm I'm shooting for the same target thicknesses. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, how do we trim a foot then and and be sure that when we get done trimming that we've left this half inch or five eighths of an inch of armor everywhere? Um, that's harder to do. Um, so the way we have to the, the way to do that is you have to have a profound understanding of where the coffin bone and where the lateral cartilages and the digital cushions are in the foot. So, um, uh, and being able to locate them. So, of course, this means radiographs are very important. Also very important dissections. Do absolutely as many dissections as you can. And that's my biggest advice for new and experienced practitioners is never bury a foot. Um, I've dissected, I don't know, hundreds of feet at this point, and I honestly learn something or gain a new insight every time I open a foot. Um, um, just, just don't ever stop dissecting every foot you can. Um, this is a, this is actually a donkey. Um, I, I put this one in here because it's the best one I have of the lateral cartilages, and and it's as important or more important that you can estimate the location of the lateral cartilages because you know we can readily see the coffin bones if we get a radiograph but but our foot reading skills unless we get an mri our foot reading skills are our only window of the lateral cartilages and the digital cushions and this one uh cindy sullivan dissected this one i've never been patient enough to um um extract out lateral cartilages whole like this uh, all this connective tissue is very tough and so hats off for her to achieving it but that's why i've thrown a donkey foot in this horse presentation even though a lot of this is relevant to donkeys but just such a beautiful view of the lateral cartilages we have in cindy's dissection here another way i would love to see more of this um, is the method dr taylor came up with um, Dr. Taylor and and her and her crew um, of taking an MRI and a CT scan and combining them in a in a, a computer program. The significance here is this could be done in a live horse, and we can actually measure the volume and density of the lateral cartilages. And some things we'll talk about here that this is a good window of um, of this bone loss I'll talk about the ski tip coffin bones. Um, this is also a good view of, of uh, the irregular shape of a coffin bone when we have a lot of bone loss of an exaggerated crena in the coffin bone. And that this was probably a keratoma um, uh, up on the up on the side um, that, that you know caused this erosion. A lot of these things I'll throw out here that this is later that there's this is a good view of. Now as this tilts on up, we're starting to be able to peak the digital cushion. And you see the flat shape of this coffin bone uh, that was yielded as we've had bone loss. Okay, so I'd love to see more of this going on, um, but this is not a cheap thing to do. Um, and and so um, and so anyway, you you take your your radiographs and your knowledge that you have from dissections and external indicators. And the next thing to imagine when trying to read the foot is the next layer out. This next layer we call the corium. And if this is a fresh cadaver and you kind of see the little hump right here, that you would actually be able to feel that you've got the hard bone in front and the lateral cartilage supporting all this area behind the coffin bone and just the thin Quarter, uh, a quarter of an inch thick layer of corium, corium covering the coffin bone and the lateral cartilages, and then we and, and and over our digital cushion. Our corium is made up of parts. It's the solar corium, the bar lamina, the frog corium, the coronary papilla, 
I forgot about my lag. Sorry, I'm gonna slow down a second. The dermal lamina, the um, um, terminal papilla, all these combined, we collectively call the corium. And you'll hear us throwing out these these different terminologies here, and um, and that's our that's our uh, and, and, and uh, that's what we're talking about. Now, different coffin bones have different shapes. So when you're when you're trying to estimate where the corium is, and then trying to visualize whether or not you have a half inch or five eighths of an inch of sole bar material or frog skin on top of that, um, it's important to be estimating how these internal structures are shaped. Different. Coffin bones have different amounts of concavity, okay? Now, you can read that shape in the sole. I've got some good slides coming up later that'll help you understand how to do that. Um, but our best tool to do that is a good digital radiograph. So if we, if we have a good digital radiograph and we got to make sure that, that our, our beam is level with the bottom of the coffin bone or close to it. And we can tell that by if we how lined up the, the, um, the Palmer processes are. So you can hear see bone there of one Palmer process. There is the other Palmer process. Okay. Here is probably one Palmer process. And here is the other Palmer process. Here is one, here is the other. Janine, am I doing okay with my lag through that discussion? Yes. And in the front of the foot, you know, this is nice and lined up. We're not seeing any double image. So, so if we have a nice level um, um, view of the coffin bone like that, we can appreciate this darker line now that is our sagittal plane that's what if we take a saw and saw a hoof in half that that is and that is our concavity okay and so so that's this plane that's the center that's the middle okay this plane this more faint line okay that is our outer periphery of the bone and that's what this one i don't know if you can see that here that's where i've dissected and left the entire coffin bone sticking out the side Okay, so that's our outer periphery, it's rounded. And so this fainter image is that. So if you have these lined up well, you can see these two lines. And if those lines come all the way out to a point, you don't have a lot of coffin bone remodeling and loss. You can also see exactly how much con con concavity that that coffin bone has. And so once you grow a ground parallel sole, now that that shape of that, I mean, a, a uniform thick sole, not ground parallel, uniformly thick sole, um, then it's going to be mimicking that shape. Now, those of you experienced will recognize this horse does actually have a little bit of bone remodeling. It does have a little bit of a ski tip, um, but it's close enough that that you know. What I find is this is not going to really affect our future growth that much. I see this coffin bone, and I expect I can grow a good foot, foot really easy around this coffin bone. Um, I don't really care how much sinking there is, um, how much rotation there is. I'm pretty confident going in, um, but because of, because of the because I've got a good bone, this has become one of the main early indicators that I can get. It's why I always want those set up trim um, lateral radiographs. Um, one of the biggest things that I'm evaluating is the condition of that bone. A word here about sole thickness is a lot of people are measuring sole thickness from the bone all the way to the ground and in a radiograph. And that's because, well, really up until you know, I don't remember what, 15 years ago, and um, we started seeing digital radiographs popping up in the nicer clinic, vet clinics. And and um, it's really been in just the last eight to 10 years that digital radiographs have become common out in the country. And um, and you, we couldn't see this then. But now, more often, we can see 
or we can or we can at least estimate where the corium is wrapping around here we can see this gap okay and so we can see a true sole thickness now the sole grows forward at about a 45 ish degree angle so that's corresponding sole and really that's the way we should think of sole growth that's the way it's growing and then this way is how we should think of sole thickness whenever someone merit measures from the tip of the coffin bone to the ground they're adding any solar concavity and the thickness of corium into that sole thickness okay so here's another one um and this one you can see you know significantly more damage um and 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 so we're looking first to see how well lined up it is we can see two lines here we can see two lines here but they're not an inch apart you know they're pretty close this is a very lined up radiograph in the back now in the front it's a little bit twisted i can appreciate two different lines of the palmer process but these are kind of close it's close enough that i can appreciate what i'm wanting to show you here which is this the sagittal plane line the red and the outer peripherally line the blue don't come all the way out to a point together the way the first one i showed you that's showing you a lot of bone loss now looking at it this way is important because a lot of people a lot of very experienced people would look at this bone and think it's okay but we've had a lot of bone loss in the front of this foot and looking at these how these two planes line up instead of coming all the way out to a point is the way we'll readily see that now it's important for us to see this because number one once we grow an adequate sole this is going to be a flatter foot this foot may have some cavity back around the frog but in the outer periphery it's going to be flat you know when we grow a correct foot around this but also when we have this much bone remodeling it really affects um it really affects our future growth um there will have been corium damage along with that there will tend to be um a difficult time growing sole on these horses there will tend to be a difficult time growing perfect lamellar connection these horses no matter what you do trimming and nutritionally if they have a lot of bone loss um, a lot of times it'll look like you've been growing perfect lamellar connection for the last four months only it's been four years you know the last inch will will just unravel um, um, and so this is common in result success story the horse is sound and getting along well um, and can be ridden in boots i consider it a success story um, if we have this degree of bone remodeling um, and this actually i have an after story this is a before picture on a horse i'll show you later um, the and i'll show you what i did achieve with this horse and what i didn't achieve with this horse but for now when you see this you know you're gonna have troubles growing sole thickness, and that uh, that you're even if you grow an adequately thick sole, it'll you'll, it'll still be kind of flat footed. We see another one. Um, this is an extreme amount of bone remodeling or bone loss. Um, if you look at our red, our sagittal plane, and this one in your handouts, I drew it wrong. I apologize. If you're doing this with handouts, change it to this way instead of the way I drew it but your sagittal plane that was a this morning catch um and so your sagittal plane um or you know that's where the plane you'll be looking at if you saw the foot in half instead of coming out to a point it meets way back here so that's showing you if you you can project you know where your your outer periphery was your sagittal plane your dorsal aspect and see how where the coffin bone used to be where it should have been and um, that's going to be a bone like this you know that you have just a tremendous amount of bone loss and you've got this big flat area just a little bit of concavity flowing you know from the back and then it just goes flat in the outer periphery and this one is gonna the best you can do and that's actually i'm proud of that soul i've grown on this horse um and uh but that's kind of rare uh you'll you'll 
often have a lot of trouble growing sole on these horses. And even when you do grow, like I have a nice sole growing on this horse. It's a horse that's been in my care for a while. Um, and you see that there's what, a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch of total concavity that this sole has, okay? So still a very flat, uh, and that, that incidentally would have an eighth of an inch collateral groove depth. I'll talk about how bone remodeling and flat coffin bones affect our collateral groove measurements later. I have some good slides on that. But this one, an eighth of an inch of total concavity here, okay, with a pretty nice sole on this horse. So um, th this is kind of best case scenario that what you can grow in a horse that feels good and is rideable in boots if you have this much remodeling. Um, so, so we take all of that information, our, our, our skills that we've gained from dissecting, um, um, our radiographs, um, our collateral groove measurements I'll talk more about later. And, you know, you combine all these, this information together to try to estimate these thicknesses of of uh of material so that we're leaving this nice thick sole material frog material and bar material all on here um now this is important in our everyday horses um in just making a sound barefoot horse or or um or a sound horse period um, but it becomes even more important when dealing with rotation and sinkers, um, uh, because with these horses, the, the, the lamina have lost their ability to support the horse vertically. And, 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 and this puts much more of a toll on the, 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 the armor nature of this. Um, but then we, so we have to think about the thickness. And basically, if I use I, I use these evaluation skills, including the radiographs, um, to make sure I have enough thickness. And if I don't have enough thickness, I protect. Now we'll talk about all the different protection methods later, but I have to be sure without when I protect, okay, that it's the secondary need need is is that the corium um, that is that there's no pressure without release. Um, it's very easy with a shoeing package or with a, some booting packages to put pressure on the sole that doesn't entirely release. And and having the 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 sole and the frog and the bars can bear a lot of vertical support, but they can't stand any pressure that doesn't release. So that's going to come important with everything we do as well. Okay, so but first before we get into that, we're going to talk about the most important aspect of achieving this thickness. Okay, is being sure that 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 we don't trim these thicknesses away. Um, I think that excess trimming of the sole and the frog and the bars are the most common mistakes in the farrier and trimmer worlds. Okay, and so you would think that it would be you would think that it would be um, obvious that we only trim when things are too long or too thick, but it's amazing how much a trimmer thinks that the answer to everything is trimming, okay? Um, sometimes the answer is leaving it alone. Sometimes the answer is padding, protecting, using hoof armor, epoxies, casting material. Um, switching terrains. Um, um, the answer is not always trimming. So I always try to try to program people to, to understand if it's thin, leave it dirty. Okay. And so this is a setup trim on a horse that I just pulled the shoes or I forget, it looks like the shoes might have fallen. No, those are fresh. It looks like I had pulled them. Um, but anyway, the sole is thin, um, the bars are thin, the frog is thin. Everything is thin. This is my post trim. Um, there was a little 
flat that was harboring infection right in here that I opened. Um, you know, I touched the heels a bit. Um, I babbled, and I want to point out here for this and all of my pictures, it looks like I thinned out the walls. But this is another picture of the same foot, you know, a second later, you know, same thing. Um, and you can see this is what that looks like. What I did, I, I left, you know, a little bit of hoof wall standing above the sole where I can um, and put this bevel on here. And, and on this side, you know, there's nothing been done. On this side, you can see where the previous farrier had thinned it, but I didn't. But when you take this image, it looks like the walls were thinned out. So this is something that I hate in all of my photos and uh, and <clears throat> the, that I'm never thinning out these hoof walls like that. You know, I'm doing this and it looks that way. But But anyway, Here's another one that, that illustrates this well. This is a post trim foot. It's a very, very sound horse. This is common. This is a common post trim situation for me. Um, the bars were fine, except this little spot was getting above the sole um, too much and I knocked it down. Look at this, the, the, the hoof wall is standing a quarter of an inch longer than the sole and has a perfect Mustang roll or Brumby bevel, wherever you are um, on it. Um, you know, th this, I mean, you know, why would you trim that? It, it's beautiful. Um, but as is very common, um, you know, the, the, the horse will tend to, on the side it loads more, um, has very, very common tendency to adjust the amount it grows with the wear rate, um, and it will and it will self-maintain or very close to it. What's actually more common is on the side the horse uses the most of each foot. I won't change the height, but I may have to address the the roll, okay, without touching the height any whatsoever. And then on her side, use less. The horse is very good at adapting its growth to its to its wear on the side it uses more, but on the side of the foot it uses less, it's not very good at growing more on this foot and less on that foot. So the horse tends to grow willy-nilly um, and grow too long on the foot it uses less. And so very often, um, very often I am leaving alone one side of the foot and trimming the other side of the foot to match, okay? Now, and this is my post trim on this horse that I trim the heels to match based on the sole plane um, and the collateral grooves, um, match the, the, the heel height, match the wall height from 10 o'clock to two o'clock around the toe from there to heels, I match that. Now in the front of the foot, I, I tend to worry more about breakover. Horses don't really care from 10 to two, whether they have hoof walls standing longer than the sole or not. Um, so they care more about their breakover. So from 10 o'clock to two o'clock, I, I, I tend to, to, to worry more about breakover and less about how much wall is standing above the sole. Um, so, um, so also on the sole itself, again, you know, this calloused off this way, there's nothing that I want to do to this sole. So this is the only place I trim this foot. And a lot of people would worry, so many people would trim every aspect of this force, you know, trim the bars a little, trim the sole a little, trim the frog a little, just because what, I am there and I have tools in my hand, or maybe it's to justify your existence, you know, but but I do this all the time and people don't really question it. I really wish they would, because I'm always prepared to answer this, and that is I charge $5 for cutting stuff off your horse. I charge $55 for knowing what not to cut off your horse. Um, and most clients have had horses lamed, um, by farriers and trimmers before. And if I'm achieving comfort and soundness and beauty in their hooves, um, then they don't question it anyway. 
Um, and that's always my answer. I would be ready to give if somebody would question it, but, but um, 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 what people don't want your sweat. What people want is their horse to be sound. This is a big window into it because another big advantage to this is this teaches you a lot of times in some terrains and hard flat terrain, the right wall height above the sole on a healthy foot may be zero, maybe sole and hoof level on hard flat terrain um, so that the sole and the wall are load sharing on that hard flat terrain. Um, on deep footing and you know a lot of rocks in the footing, it may be a quarter of an inch like this one. And then other footings that may be anywhere in between this is the right foot. So if you're listening to the side of the foot or feet that the horse uses more, and, um, then, then that'll show you a lot of times what's right in that environment. Um, but the other reason is, is that if a horse adapts and is growing the right amount of foot um, and, and um, um, for your trim cycle, and it's grown it to the right height for the horse's own needs, and you trim it anyway, that registers to the horse as a loss. And what it does is it accelerates the growth. Okay, now that doesn't hurt you too much on the side used more, okay? But where that hurts you is over here, it also accelerates the growth over here, which will make the flares impossible in wall cracks and white line disease and the problems on the side less used, um, uh, more difficult to grow or impossible to grow out because you're accelerating the growth. I learned this from horse owners doing their own trimming that I would see um, getting the foot growing so fast that it has to be trimmed once a week or, or, um, or it'll overgrow and mechanically flare. Um, and now once a week trimming is great for horses, but be careful to only trim the parts that overgrow. Leave the parts that don't overgrow dirty. Okay, so the concept of don't cut sole from thin sold horses, and this applies to the bars and the frogs as well, um, seems so obvious. So, so, you know, why in the world would anyone cut sole from the, a horse that has a correct sole thickness, or worse, why would anyone cut sole from a horse that has a thin sole? When I'm telling you that it's the most common mistake in the farrier and trimmer industry. I'm gonna list, there's I think 13 common reasons that I see why. Number one is just what this whole presentation, the main thing of this presentation is we have a deep CE. And so the foot looks too long. This is the same foot from page one, where so many people would over trim this foot. And so you remember from the radiographs, we're correct to a little bit too thin in the back of the foot. We have a paper thin sole in the front of the foot. Like let almost everyone, uh, or I won't say not PHC people, but <laughs> so many people would, 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 professionals would be having you cut material from the bottom of this foot. So many horse owners, if you left the foot like this, would be accusing you of leaving the foot too long and veterinarians as well. Whereas if we didn't have the one inch too deep CE, if the cornet was down here where it's supposed to be, almost everyone will be telling us that the, the truth, which is that we need to build sole thickness on this foot, that this foot is too short. So, so that's the number one reason and people not understanding it, okay? Number two is exfoliation. Um, and you have to be very, very careful with this one, especially with horses um, that, that have bone remodeling and thus a slow capacity to grow soul. Um, a lot of times you may have quarter of an inch of, of, you know, the six millimeters of good real sole thickness and 10 millimeters, you know, almost a half an inch of, um, of exfoliating sole in the situation. In that case, it is a horrific mistake 
to exfoliate all of your loose, crumbly, exfoliating material down to good soul. Um, however, if you have a nice half inch, five eighths of an inch thick sole, um, and you have a half inch of exfoliating sole on top of that, it's common, especially in the desert. We don't see it much in the east, um, unless it's like a horse that has been having its wall length and bar length neglected, then excess can build in in the east or a horse that's been stall bound. But um, we rarely see it otherwise. Um, but out west in desert areas, it's very common that you've got a good sole and a thick exfoliating sole. Um, in that case, you know, you need to take the exfoliating sole off. Um, in either case, I think when you get to about five eighths of an inch thick, and that's good, healthy sole plus exfoliating sole, you need to stop. Okay. Um, and in any case, I find horses go better. I intentionally try to leave a quarter of an inch, you know, five or six millimeters of exfoliating sole on top of my healthy, true sole plane. Um, because I just think horses go better and that thickness doesn't hurt anything. So, so um, a lot of people I think are too much a stickler for removing all of the chalky exfoliating sole. And I think that's that be, you know, very, very detailed is always a mistake. But again, doing any exfoliating sole can be a mistake if the exfoliating sole plus the good sole equals less than five eighths of an inch or which is uh, 15 millimeters. Um, trimming sole down into fresh, clean white line. Uh, this is more of a horseshoe um, issue, but um, but again, you know, something that you need to understand that, you know, a lot of people will just cut, cut, cut into the sole until they get down to a clean white line. Well, this is an extreme white line disease case and where I think most of you be able to see if you if you cut down into good white line, you would make it to the blood, keep going to the bone, keep going, cut, cut, cut. Uh, you know, obviously that's a mistake, but you see this in a lot lesser, um, uh, a lot lesser mistakes that people will take away soul um, until they get to a clean white line. Now, White line disease is a real issue, but if we have white line disease, we need to soak. We need to we need to balance the diet. We need to probably cut carbs. You know, there's all sorts of things we need to do for that. Um, but when a horse has bad lamina, now the hoof walls can't support it. So that's when a horse needs a thick sole the most. So it's one of the most common times when there's a bad white line. Most common times that people out there industry wide will take away the sole, and that is when a horse needs a nice sit sole the most. So, huge, huge mistake. Um, and um, this one, I gave a similar presentation to the to the American Farriers Association, um, and showed showed them you know this these slides here, and told them <laughs> to there you know this is the most common problem right here. This one the the that lands uh people over to the dark side of us barefooters um as farriers doing this one so what we need to do is everything we can to grow good white lines same foot um, however many months later um, through a winter um that now we grew better connected walls and now i'm starting to leave walls standing above the sole um and um, and starting to use even though there is still wall flare but now I'm starting to use these walls, whereas here I was not using the walls um, for support, but all the while leaving the sole alone. Okay, and the next reason common that people will just be removing the entire sole off, off the horse is, um, um, is in the name of sole pressure. The, they'll have it in mind that they, um, that, that they can, cut the sole a little bit um, um, shorter than the hoof wall, and that takes away all of the sole pressure. But actually out in the real world, a horse steps on a rock and you're increasing pressure to the corium when you do that. Um, um, while the, um, 
um, um, sorry, I blanked. You're increasing pressure to the corium because you took away the armor when you do that. So unless the horse lives on a plane of glass, we're leaving the sole relative to the hoof wall by an eighth of an inch um, is not going to take any pressure off the solar corium. Um, if they step on anything uneven, you're actually increasing pressure to the solar corium. So there's a lot of people, and this is where I have to pick on the, the barefoot community um, as a whole more than the horseshoeing community is that, is that, um, very few barefooters um, uh, take away soul at the toe, um, but we have a lot of them take a lot of them that take away soul and bar uh, material at the back of the foot. The most common reasons for this, now horseshoers do it too. Usually, in the name of this one, bringing weight bearing back. There's been a big push in the farrier industry to be a stickler for bringing weight bearing back on, on horses. Um, and, but you have to watch the real world versus theory world or the horse moving through its environment versus standing in the wash rack, um, being trimmed. Um, like if I trimmed this extreme to bring the, that brings the weight bearing back, but now I've cut almost all the way to the end of the, of the, uh, the coronary, I mean, the solar papilla. It's going to cause extreme tenderness. That horse would land on its toes. So in the real world, what did I do? I brought the weight bearing forward five inches, trying to bring it back an inch. So I brought it back an inch standing or in theory world without moving around by making the horse compensate and land on its toes. I brought the weight bearing forward. So big mistake there and a common one. But again, people doing this, a lot of times doing ex, uh, excessive uh, uh, exfoliating and cleaning about the bars, chasing flared bars, bent bars. Um, um, now, I like strong straight bars as much as anyone on the planet, but the secret to strong straight bars is heel first impact. So a lot of people that are being too much of a stickler or that if a flared or bent bar causes them to thin a bar more than a half an inch to the corium and not leave that half inch of armor, again, you're gonna cause a horse to toe load, which is the biggest cause of flared or bent bars. It perpetuates the problem. Um, now that said, um, now everybody says, you know, Pete Ramey doesn't trim the bars. You know, I do trim the bars. It's just that in a flare bent bar situation, I'm going to stop at sole level. And if they're thin, if it's thinner than a half an inch thick, the sole and the bar there, I'm going to protect in some way. We'll talk about that. Um, and I'm going to ensure that good, comfortable move and that strengthens, straightens and strengthens the bars. Okay. Um, and and whereas um, going cutty cutty until you have thinned that area in the back more is just going to cause toe loading and perpetuate the problem. Um, so cut flared bars to the sole basically, and then do everything else you can do to inform and correct movement and stop. Um, main, main thing is do everything you can fight. Um, due to fight wall flare because wall flare is also working to pull the bars out. Um, number seven, attempting to achieve specific heel heights relative to, the very, relative to the very mobile coronet location. I've covered this again. Very common that people understand the deep CE concept at the toe, but the heels, very few people do. The, the, that, and people still teaching to trim to certain heel heights based on the coronet, don't do it, okay? Your heel height needs to be measured in terms of how much thickness you have from the corium, okay? Not where the highly mobile coronet is, okay? Um, this one we see very few barefoot or natural hoof care practitioners doing. Um, and we see horseshoers doing more. 
pretty rare to see horseshoers thin out soles in the back of the foot. Very common to see them do it in the front of the foot. Um, and most common reason, again, kind of covered this well enough already, trimming toes to specific lengths based on the coronet. Um, or worse, just making it look right. Um, and if you got a deep CE, the, this correct thickness of, of sole won't look right. It'll look like the foot's still long. And then maybe worse, the flared foot. And watch those words. We need to stand the horse up. Um, um, a lot of horses, if we have perfect wall connection, we have practitioners that wouldn't thin the sole, but let the wall flare. It looks like a duck. And all of a sudden we have more people that are wanting to thin the sole in the front of the foot um, and to, to, to make it appear shorter. Okay, another big mistake there. Um, number 12 has to do with um, um, this arch we see from front to back. Now this is natural in horses. They're basically almost always gonna have it um, internally because we got the front of the foot supported by the coffin bone, the back of the foot supported by the collateral cartilages, and in the art shape is just the natural way they hook up, okay? <clears throat> so that, that arch is one of many coiled springs that the horse has in, in effect. Now, when the horse loads the foot, when he, in this case, he's standing on it double loaded with the other foot off the ground, that arch draws out almost flat. It's probably supposed to, to, um, to draw out completely flat, thus a ground parallel coffin bone at peak impact loads, okay? But in an unloaded foot, we probably have this, you know, more positive palmer angle as the front half of that arch, okay? Okay, so usually, so again, that's just a natural way that almost every horse is. Okay, internally. Usually when that arch isn't there, it's because we don't have enough sole um, in the front of the foot or the back of the foot or both. Okay, and so we have a problem of, of, of some farriers, I guess a lot of horseshoers um, don't like this arch. And so we have a common problem of cutting sole off the front of the foot, sometimes off the back of the foot, in order to erase the arch that we see in horseshoers. But then we see in some barefooters, not just to pick on them, barefooters tend to like this arch and understand the need for this arch. And so we'll have a horse that, that has a thin sole at the front of the foot, the people that'll teach to also thin the sole in the middle of the foot in order to artificially cause the arch. And that I find to be a mistake. Just wait. And when you have built adequate sole thickness everywhere, the arch will tend to be there. I just, I've done that before, but everything, something I should tell you about me, um, I don't really teach anything from theory or theory world. If I do, I tell you, um, I teach from what I've seen and done. And so trust me, every time I tell you don't do something, um, I have done it. Um, um, so and this is one of a long list of everything I tell you not to do that I've tried, um, um, is don't artificially create this arch when you have a thin sole at the toe and or the heels by making the sole also thin at the quarters. That's a, that's a no, no. Okay. Now the thing of it is in all these things I listed and then even still, you know, number 13, which I haven't done yet. Um, and all these things that trick people into cutting feet sh sh or short, too short, are things I want as well. Um, I want a short hoof capsule. I want short toes. I want short heels. I want the weight bearing back. Um, um, I want strong straight bars. Um, I want to arch from front to back. I, I want um, 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 solar concavity, which I'll talk about next. Um, I want all these just as much as anyone, but the true fact of the matter is, is, is we can't, walking up to most horses, we can't have all of those. We have to pick one. And so I've picked this 
half inch to five eighths of an inch, uh, 12 to 15 millimeters of sole thickness, bar thickness, frog skin thickness um, is my number one. Um, that when I can't have everything, when I can't have all of these, I can only have one, that's the one that I pick. And that's where you've heard me say this if you've been to my clinics. Um, uh, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything because all these theories that make people um, want to cut sole and bar and frog from the bottom of the foot, they sound good. Okay. But this is the one the horses like better. And so this is not my pick. It's, it's the horses pick the the horses like it better. And also, by the way, your progress that you will make um, um, if you will pick the the thickness of material on the bottom of the foot that when I think of hoof length I'm thinking of a measurement from the corium down okay um, when I think of bar the bars I'm thinking of how thick they are, they are how much armor is covering the bar corium okay when I think about the frog I'm thinking about how much armor is covering the frog corium. that that's what I'm thinking of in terms of length okay so that would require Achieving that adequate thickness would require a radiograph in the front of the foot. It would require an MRI at the back of the foot at every trim, if not for this phenomenon here. And that's the collateral grooves I've mentioned several times. Um, that's our seam between the frog corium and the sole corium in the front of the foot, between the bar laminate and the frog corium in the back of the foot. Now, the cool thing here is that the bottom of that groove is that it has a very, very strong tendency to be eight or nine millimeters, three, three eighths of an inch thick from the bottom of that groove to the corium. Okay, and that's very, very stable uh, with exceptions I'll talk about in a minute. Um, regardless of whether a foot is too long, too short, or just right. So what that means is if I have good sole, on a horse really it's just out here at the outer periphery if my corium is the adequate height off the ground then my collateral groove height will be higher off the ground if if um we didn't if our corium is touching the ground or very close to the ground is this right here in this outer periphery then our collateral groove is going to be closer to the ground so it's that is kind of how I can use the collateral groove depth to, to estimate how, how much sole there is right here in the outer periphery. And so I measure that like this, I lay a straight edge wherever I want to appreciate. Like if I want to appreciate the sole thickness here and here, I allow, I allow for that. I mean, may I let place the sole, the, the rasp there. If I want to appreciate sole thickness at the toe, I would lay my rasp from heel to toe, okay? Now next, I have to erase if the wall is standing longer than the sole, okay? We're not talking about that. I have to subtract any height difference. So this is only for estimating how much sole there is right here in the outer periphery. You also can't tell anything about the sole thickness in the middle of the foot. I'll show you how to do that later, okay? And so, and so, so to to appreciate the sole thickness in the outer periphery, I'll I'll lay the rasp there. Now, if I have adequate sole thickness um, in the outer periphery, this collateral groove depth tends to be, you know, 12 to 15 millimeters tends to be a half an inch to 15 millimeters of depth. If I have 12 to 15 millimeters of of sole thickness right here in the outer periphery, okay? Because I have, uh, because my, um, 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 my collateral groove depth is standing up off the corium um, there, you know, um, by, you know, nine millimeters or so, okay? Um, now in the back of the foot, this is a little trickier back here. We have the same thing going on, but our lateral cartilages are bent unloaded, which is when we can measure these, into a steeper arch than the coffin bone. And so we have a and we have our coffin bone should be a little bit elevated in the front on a horse that's not at peak impact loads. 
okay? Where we should have that positive Palmer angle. So we have a deeper collateral groove in the, in the back of the foot if we have the same sole thickness at the outer periphery, okay? Usually about 25 millimeters, okay? Sometimes 18 millimeters, which is three quarters of an inch. Sometimes 25 millimeters, which is, you know, an inch, okay? Um, that is normal. This also varies, we have to watch with heel contraction. And yes, I need to do this with a wet cadaver and actually squeeze it. Or somebody can do that for me. If you, next time I dissect or next time you dissect, squeeze around on this and take some pictures. But this is my lame attempt to illustrate if a foot's contracted, we'll have a deeper collateral groove in the back of the foot for a given sole thickness at the outer periphery, just because the foot's contracted and our collateral grooves are bent up into a deeper arch, okay? So, you know, this is complicated and, and nothing better than an estimate anyway, but better than nothing because in general, we can use this collateral groove. The better, the, the less pull your hair out way to think of this is, is that we can use the collateral groove to, let me back way up, I shouldn't put this here, to locate the, where the corium is. If we have a basic understanding of what the corium and the internal structures are shaped like, then we can estimate, you know, the thickness of all this material or where this is in the foot and what it's shaped like in there. Okay, the exceptions. Janine, I've been going for an hour and 15 minutes. Should we stop for a break? I don't need to, but I'm asking, I don't know what's normal for people. I, I still got a long way to go. If you're good, we should be good. If Unless anybody types in into the chat box. Well, that's, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. And, and I know I'm everybody good. else pees while they're watching these things. <laughs> I'm not, okay, so. keep going. <laughs> All right, I'll let you know. That's why um, we keep the cameras off. Yeah, that keeps me from being nervous as I as I, I don't even have to visualize it. I know y'all are peeing while I'm teaching this thing. So um, uh, so key exceptions, this further complicates it to a point that it makes people want to throw their hands up and, and say, I can't even use the collateral grooves at all. But but actually 98, 9% of the time, the collateral grooves are very, very useful information it, it, it's just that with these exceptions sometimes they straight lie to you so you have to take everything with a grain of salt that you get from them so number one is microbial microbial infection can not only eat its way to the corium in the down in the collateral grooves it can keep going and eat its way on into the digital cushion lateral cartilage into the bone um so obviously becomes a not reliable place to measure from. So um, if, if you drag a hoof pick through the collateral grooves and pull out a gray or white cottage cheese type material, um, be suspicious of any measurements. That's, um, um, that, that's a sign that fungus has been eating its way deeper. Um, if you if you learn to identify that fungus smell, the clinics always find it and pass it around. <clears throat> fungus um, and the fungal infection of foot, which I think is what's doing the active eating um, of good tissue, the bacteria being more opportunistic in eating um, already dead tissue. Um, it has a different smell, um, has a different smell than rotten, um, manure um, than bacterial infection so usually in clinics i try to find you know that smell and pass it around but but the smell of fungal infection um, is different and when you smell it um, be suspicious of these measurements um, and that you get from the collateral groove um, and then also if you find any sensitivity um down in there you know that <clears throat> you always have a situation where um either 
fungus is eaten to the corium or very close to it, or it may also be an old wound down in there, but if you find sensitivity down in there, don't trust the measurements. Um, and um, um, the, the, the other, the, the next one is, is if there's been a previous abscess. Um, now, usually this will be, um, you know, when there's been a, the frog corium and the solar corium have abscessed, the whole deal will pop loose like a giant uh, blood blister, including a false collateral groove measurement, okay, that it can lie to you. Uh, that one tricks you into being conservative when you probably should be because it's generally not correct. There, there will be a shell um, of, of, of old growth and then new stuff growing underneath, and it's usually a mistake to take that outer shell off until the new growth underneath has reached adequate thickness. And usually by then or before then, the old growth falls off anyway. So that one usually tricks us to be conservative when we should be. So that one doesn't get you in as much trouble. This is the one that'll get you in trouble if you take collateral groove depth too literally. Another one on that is like, say, if I go on an overgrown foot and, and I've got bar material or frog material that's been laid over the collateral groove for a long time and it's all just foul, rotten, even mostly rotten bacterial stench underneath, but the collateral groove has been covered. I don't, I don't trust that at all. I, I assume the that I've had good tissue eaten out of my collateral grooves. And so I have to use radiographs and estimating soil thickness and the shape of the soil. I have to use other stuff to make these estimates. I don't use the collateral groove depth at all. The other one, and this is less common in the east, more common in the west in dry conditions, but the depending on different frog conformations in the back of the foot, um, um, sometimes you know, you can, the collateral groove information may be correct, but you can't ab access it. Um, you stick a probe down in there to measure the collateral groove depth, and you don't really know if you're in the bottom of it or not, just because it's dry and tight back there. So, so that in those, I think the information is usually correct, but we can't abscess it which, uh, without doing obscene and damaging things to the frog to, um, um, uh, to to um, to access that information. Okay, so again, I don't want to scare you off the collateral grooves completely, but because it's only one or two percent of the time, I find that you can't trust them. But but you know, I can't just not mention these. Another thing, while I've got this slide up here, is your collateral groove depth is 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 is, is get telling us our thickness at the outer periphery and not telling us what anything about the middle. So we may have what, this is what I'll call a correct deep terrain foot that we, they like this deep solar concavity. Um, they like this heavily beveled roll. Okay. But that's not, oh, but in that terrain, that's not making anything passive. Um, the soles getting where and doing support, the hoof walls getting support. Um, so that's the right trim. And that's going to have that same collateral groove height, you know, front to back as it would in what I'll call the flat terrain foot. And that if you if you're always trimming this way and you've got a hard horse that lives on a sheet of ice or lives on a hard baked out paddock or works on hard trails or hard um, roads, you know, this may be your correct role. You may be need to let sole and bar fill in in the middle so that you want to leave enough expansion room in the middle of the foot, but then this needs to bottom, bottom out um, and give support so that we don't, if you always trim this way, when horses worked on a hard terrain, um, and I probably should have drawn this one with load sharing of the wall and laminate or slight load sharing. Um, that this may be right for a horse that lives on hard, flat terrain that we're not hanging the horse by the lamina as this foot would. But I want to point out here, talking about the collateral grooves, 
that we're going for the same collateral groove depths front and back on both these feet. Because what the only thing we're using the collateral groove for is for estimating the sole thickness right here in the outer periphery. And it should probably be the same in both of these feet. Okay. That brings us to what tricks people into excessively thinning soles. Number 13 is this, uh, this concept of trying to create solar concavity. Okay. When you look at a flat foot, you have to look at the collateral grooves to consider what's going on. Okay. Um, a lot of people are looking at a flat foot and trying to try to try to carve out all the solar concavity they can in that foot without recognizing the situation here. The situation here is because you have such a shallow collateral groove, our sole thickness is correct right here, but only right here. We need to build adequate sole thickness everywhere in order to achieve that nice concave foot that everybody wants and dreams of. Okay. Um, so when we look at this flat foot, um, and we start trying to grow this this thin sole. We start trying to grow in a, a thicker sole. It's going to be achieved from the inside out. And this is a terrible design. It's just the way the foot grows. I wish that a thin sole would just get thicker everywhere, along and along and along. But it doesn't. Um, it, it it does all of its thickening from the inside out. And so when we've got a, when we're partway in the process, we're going to see this flat spot in the outer periphery. Okay. Now watch that one. You know, you're going to have a foot that looks like this. And see how that foot, we've got concavity flowing up from the frog all nice. Okay. And then it goes pancake flat right in the outer periphery. See that? Okay. Now what that means probably is that you don't have enough soul in the outer periphery. Okay, but what a lot of people do, the mistake is trying to concave that foot and walk up to that foot and create concavity. So when you do that, which is cutting the blue dashed line, okay, this red line was already correct soul thickness. Now you might have given yourself a warm, fuzzy feeling, but you hurt the horse because you took a spot where the sole was adequately thick and now made it too thin. You took a spot that was adequately thick and now made it too thin. Instead, you need to be thinking about this is all good. Okay. And, you know, so when you're looking at this foot and you're seeing it's flat in the outer periphery, okay, that you're seeing that you need to add, you have this material that you're hoping to grow someday to achieve complete concavity. Okay. So that's your situation when you see that flat spot in the outer periphery. Be careful that your trimming isn't causing that, another common thing. But if this was easy, robots would be doing it. Another thing that flat spot in the outer periphery might be showing you is that bone loss that I was talking about. That if you have bone loss in the outer periphery and you grow a perfectly wonderful soul, Okay, then you're going to end up with with the flatness at the outer periphery because that's just mirroring the shape of your bone. Okay, but either way, you know, don't trim in this region um, when you're seeing this flat spot in the outer periphery um, because horses with remodeled coffin bones almost always have trouble building sole in the outer periphery. They just have less capacity to grow it. So, um, it, so it's it's um, uh, when you see that flat spot in the outer periphery, it's still not correct to try to concave this foot and make it and make it look more concave. Very very common problem that I'm seeing. Very very smart uh, practitioners making the mistake of this. Okay, now the next one, and this has become a real pet of mine over the last five years, is is um, um, is expanding my own uh, 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 understanding of this is this that it's natural for a horse to have a straight drop off into the collateral groove 
right between the sole and the frog. That drop off should be, you know, about a quarter of an inch to maybe up to three eighths of an inch. Um, straight drop off into the collateral grooves. That would be, you know, six to, to eight millimeters. Um, a straight drop off. Okay. And see, a lot of people still concaving the sole out until you get to the bottom of the collateral groove. Well, we know that the collateral groove is eight or nine millimeters or three eighths of an inch thick, um, you know, to the corium. So if you carve your solar concavity in the front of the foot out until you're at the bottom of the collateral groove, you just cut your sole thickness to, to you know, three eighths of an inch, which is half what we need. And that's and it might be worse if you swept as the line I drew it sweeps even closer to the corium. You know, you may have cut it even closer to the corium than that if you didn't figure this arch to cut the sole perfectly. Okay. This is a real, real common boo-boo here. Um, so it's common to see a ridge form along the apex of uh, um, you know from from the bars along the sides of the frog and sometimes wrapping around the apex of the frog. And so if you see this ridge forming along the sole, measure this height, measure how tall that little ridge is from the top of the ridge to the collateral grooves. If it's only a quarter of an inch or so, so you have this situation and which means that in this spot, in this spot only, you have correct sole thickness. All the rest of the sole is too thin, okay? If you see a ridge adjacent to the frog and you measure the depth or around the apex of the frog, and this is a half inch deep, then you may have an adequate thick sole everywhere and this ridge is added on the front. Then it might be appropriate to cut that ridge off adjacent to the frog, okay? Unless, that front, remember I showed you in the picture, the frog, the, you gotta consider your terrain, that foot might be trying to adapt to a flatter terrain, a harder, flatter terrain, in which case a quarter of an inch or so of solar concavity may be what's correct for that horse on that terrain. So looking at how you tell, so we walk up to this foot, and this foot, you know, the bar ends here. And then we have a ridge of sole sticking up, okay? And so if I look at it here, and this is how none of my hoof pick I can see. So, so basically, you know, I've got no ridge. Sometimes that ridge wraps around the apex of the frog, but this one just goes flat straight out from the bottom of the collateral groove. This is a wicked, scary, thin sole right here at the toe. Okay, but then if you look at the sides, you know, we've only got about a quarter of an inch of depth um, to, to the top of this ridge. Okay, so this is the one like I showed you in the drawing. I have adequate correct sole thickness here, and it's too thin. I got adequate sole thickness here, but everywhere else, the sole is too thin. Okay, so Cutting the ridge off right here is a huge, huge mistake. Um, and because because it's growing sole here first. And again, in fact, this picture is really great. You can see the sole trying to spread, you know, in waves across the foot and trying to, you know, the, the growth is here and it, and it spreads that way. Me and doctor proved that in the, in the study we did where we, um, we drill BBs into the foot and track the sole growth. And then also by tracking pigment, you know, the, 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 the sole, sole um, intertubular horn is being produced along this ridge and then migrating all the way out to the outer periphery. And you can kind of see that happening in this picture. And that's the way it grows, you know. So, so and that's, again, I would love it if soles didn't thicken this way, if they just got thicker, all across their, their, their way so that you gradually got more thickness all the way, but they just basically, a thin sole never thickens that way. They, they get thicker here first, 
and then gradually over time they get thicker 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 out the outer periphery until finally you reach adequate thickness until you've achieved this um, and you know that's just the way they do it but if you come along instead and cut this ridge off every time then all they'll do is just repeatedly regrow that ridge and you'll never achieve soil thickness adequate soil thickness everywhere else i've got better slides as we go that this that, that, that'll show this happening okay so again you want to evaluate that i'm not saying you don't trim in this region because often it's appropriate to in fact a lot of times it's common for me to trim in this region it's just that I'm I'm always leaving this quarter of an inch to five eighths of an inch, I mean to three eighths of an inch thick straight drop off into the collateral grooves, and I'm never concaving all the way to the bottom of that collateral groove. And so, <coughs> excuse me, I have a strong tendency to take out material in the middle of the foot, and but but stopping short of erasing that that quarter of an inch drop off while leaving the sole in the outer periphery okay now there's a time and place to trim sole from the outer periphery it's when it gets more than five eighths of an inch thick but it's just rare uh, that's all it happens but usually it happens in hind feet uh, but um but by doing that by continuing to to do that over time is how you achieve you know deep concavity that you can still do that and leave that drop off the 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 just just don't concave if you're concaving all the way until this groove is erased you'll never achieve adequate sole thickness in the outer periphery because the horse will just keep replacing this over and over and over again put all of its growth capability right here and this illustrates this and uh, uh, the, the well here. Um, this is the foot that the the most people are calling a um, a, a retracted sole. Um, I don't. I tend to. I think all these I've seen are just thin soles. But what happens a lot of times is in a thin soled horse. The horse will either be standing on a rim of lamellar wedge in the outer periphery, or a lot of times the and this is common with bone remodeling, the the horse will have a reduced capacity to grow sole all over the place except right at the at the at the um, terminal papilla, and they'll keep growing sole well. Okay, so. So, and what I see in these horses a lot of times is the horse has this thin sole year round, but then during wet conditions, that becomes less abrasive and the lamellar wedge and or the sole at the outer periphery and or the hoof wall stand up taller and that makes it look like the sole retracted. When in fact, in all these cases that I've seen both research and online, and these I saw myself, um, you just got a thin sole and a proud periphery. Now this I actually watch happening. This and another one I'll show you were horses that the previous a horseshoer had cut the entire sole to the blood and then shod the horse and the horse was lame and I pulled the shoes off the horse and I used hoof armor here and, um, um, and boots and pads um, and, and used uh, um, easy boot clouds on this horse um, to and, um, and then this was right before this was five weeks later after pulling the shoes that I had built this periphery and so you can see here that that there is zero depth or actually you might have to take my word for it but this is one you have to watch a lot of people are trimming this way of concaving the foot to the bottom of the collateral grooves okay so right here at the collateral groove my sole is three eighths of an inch thick okay which is half what we need or near half what we need okay but then see how that sole swoops that way it's another example where you know, i think it gets even closer to the corium right here okay so 
here's the same foot. I remember, I think, you know, seven, eight months later, eight, seven months later, the, the, now I've achieved this vertical straight drop off. Okay. I went from concave. This one was concave to the collateral grooves. This one has that straight vertical drop off and then more of a straight plane to the concavity. Okay. Now, an interesting thing is this foot and this foot both have the same collateral groove height off the ground. They're both, you know, about a half an inch or 12 millimeters. The collateral groove is off the ground. So, but, but this one has wall and maybe a little bit of sole at the outer or lamellar wedge at the outer periphery that's lifting that up. And this is all airspace in the middle. Okay. So, this one has the same collateral groove height. So the whole sole, we have to estimate the shape and that's from the collateral groove plus this vertical drop off has to be there. Same the apex of frog has to have this vertical drop off or you have a thin sole. Okay. Um, and so this of course hadn't been trimmed. That's just the way it's callous. In fact, I didn't touch this sole, probably not at all with anything except a, a brush. Um, from January to September, and, and, and this is just the natural state that it grew. Okay, here's the shot here, and you can see, and, like, and that's important because some people might look at this foot and think it looks okay, or think the foot's okay because it has a half an inch collateral groove depth at the apex of the frog, but we have to consider this shape here as well. Now, and, but this one is my best case I have of tracking this. This was um, the next trim after this day was this, and this had already occurred. So this was 10 weeks after pulling the shoes that I had grown this ridge all the way around the frog. See that? Okay. And so that's where I'm showing you. So I've got this, if I measure that ridge, and at that time it was only a quarter of an inch to the bottom of the collateral grooves, I know not to cut that ridge off. If I measured, if I saw that ridge around the frog and measured down, it was a half an inch. Okay, maybe I need to cut only a quarter of an inch off, but I need to stop when that quarter a ridge is a quarter of an inch based on the collateral grooves. Because what I've achieved here is adequate sole thickness only right here in this one spot, and it's still too thin everywhere else. But soles have to achieve adequate sole thickness here before they'll put any growth energy into the to the outer periphery. And that's a terrible design, but it sucks, but it's true. Okay, so see here's where that, you know, fast forward, and now you can't see that ridge anymore, but it's still there. Okay, it's just that now when I built adequate sole thickness also here and here and here, that now that ridge, you can't, you don't know, see it as a ridge. It's just adequate sole thickness. Okay. This is another one that illustrates it um, here. It's actually put at the same barn, same farrier, all that. This one was worse because this is all wound, just literally, you know, cut, you know, deep on into the corium right here is cut onto the blood. Um, um, and, and same thing, this was five weeks after I pulled the shoes that I took this, that I had gained this depth of the outer periphery. But this is a, what a lot of people would look at and call it a retracted sole. But because I have zero depth to that groove around the apex of the frog, I know that I've just got a thin sole. Um, I can, from this angle, I can see the bottom of my collateral groove. The sole's just thin. It didn't retract anywhere. And then here's the same foot some months later, the same thing. I've achieved um, this quarter of an inch straight drop off into the collateral grooves. And so that's important. Again, this foot and this foot have the same collateral groove depth because they have the same height off the ground, the outer periphery. But if the posse was chasing you, which horse would you want to swing up on? You know, this is a way, way better foot, even though it may appear to have less solar concavity, what horses need is the adequate soul thickness. Okay. And so 
this brings up a concept and this is a foot actually that I'm showing is after foot later that's kind of going to tie all this conversation together um, that that, um, that I talked about some horses are just standing on Leo Lamella wedge around the outer periphery and so and a lot of people would look at this radiograph and think this foot's okay you know um, but there's things you can see we've talked about the corium's too thick Okay, our HL zone, our total measurement from the bone to the outer hoof wall that you can measure is, is probably going to be instead of a normal 18 to 20 millimeters, it's going to be you know probably 25 millimeters an inch. So we got you know trouble in paradise here at the lamina. Then look, you can see where the proximal end of the hoof wall this is migrated out of that niche right there. <clears throat> okay, so there's problems, you know, with this foot that a lot of people would look at and, and think are normal. But I'm really wanting to show you this foot here. You know, the people need to start looking at this horse. The, 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 this horse is standing on a rim of lamellar wedge. This is in the same foot. But this is a, the most obvious one I could find. This is sole and this is lamellar wedge. The, that you know you this is your soul here that a lot of these horses that people are calling calling retracted souls are standing on a lamellar wedge not all of them some of them are, some of them are standing on proud soul that's growing only from the terminal papilla and having a lamellar wedge but but where'd i go okay if you look at a but how to tell is this is if you just get a get a lateral radiograph and project the dorsal aspect of the bone to the ground and what's behind it is sole it grew from the bottom of the coffin bone what's in front of it is lamellar wedge and that's what you know grew from from between the the was expressed between the the dermal and epidermal lamina okay um, the the way you can can tell and evaluate these these horses Okay, so here this kind of brings full picture. The, uh, this is the one of the horses I showed you earlier. I said I'd come back to. Very lame, very foundered, paper thin sole. Um, and um, um, and um, the, this, even though the hoof had been thinned out by the previous farrier, the true rotation well, where your marker is, yeah, is way out so um, and thin sole. And here's the same foot eight months later. Um, and so I've kind of shown this as a success case, and it is. This horse is a, it's a, it's a gated horse. It's high mileage trail horse, um, does its trail miles and boots, um, uh, but does a lot of arena uh, barefoot and close to home barefoot riding and then long riding in boots. Um, but there's pr problems here that, that I want you to be able to predict is trouble growing sole. It's a decent sole, but it's probably only about three eighths of an inch thick. Okay, I'd like to see almost twice that. This is the one I showed you that has it's lost a lot of bone in the front. I, I could predict going in that I'm going to have trouble growing sole here. But also look the way the the hoof had migrated, the the proximal end of the hoof had migrated out of that niche. Okay, that the, the tend not to be able to reverse that. Okay, and sure enough, I have it, you know, and so in these horses, I tend not to be able to grow a perfect lamellar connection. There's, there's, um, there's, there's dermal lamina damage here. And so this situation of, of having lamellar wedge supporting this horse at the outer periphery, um, I still have going on in my after picture, in my success story. Okay, so um, uh, it, it's just something that I want. The best thing I can do for you as professionals is is have your expectations realistic. I achieved comfort in the pasture barefoot. I achieved rideable absolutely anywhere in boots. Um, and, and even like again, this is a very very high mileage horse. Um, and and you know this horse can do a lot of light riding and hard arena riding barefoot um, too. So, um, uh, but but I'm never going to grow a perfect foot here. Um, I'm never going to you know uh, fully reverse uh, you know, this CE fully 
you know, make a perfectly connected wall. Um, you know, my white line is going to always kind of look like garbage on this horse. And, and so, again, I want to be sure you all have realistic expectations and that if you'll get that lateral radiograph on day one, this is very, very predictable. Um, um, in fact, this is the best case scenario outcome, actually, um, for the amount of, of um, not only bone loss here, but lateral cartilage calcification as well um, that we didn't talk about. Um, 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 so, so now I'm almost done. Um, we come back to our first slide. And again, now with more information, um, hopefully everyone you know here, if you weren't already, is completely immune to this. And, and I think most most PHCP members were already aware of, of much of this stuff. But hopefully, I've given you ammo because again, you're the, the vet, the horse owner. Everyone is going to be wanting you to cut this foot shorter, and and you're going to have to be able to explain this situation. And you can do that. The collateral grooves are helpful in, in showing you that. This horse has a, um, a three quarter of an inch, 18 millimeter uh, collateral groove depth at the deepest part. So I know that I don't have heel to cut off this horse, even though looking at it here, most people think that it's going to, including me, walking up this horse is going to think I'm going to have a lot of heel to cut off. And I've got a zero collateral groove depth at the, at the apex of the frog. So I know that, that, um, that I've got an um, a inadequate sole in the front of the foot. Okay. And even without radiographs, I'm going to be looking at this frog, like I showed you, um, that's, that's, um, that I've got way too much hoof out in front of the apex of the frog. So I'm going to know that I have some rotation. Now, again, I'm not knocking radiographs. My number one reason for my number one use, number two, number one use of my foot reading skills is not hurting horses with my hoof trimming tools. Number two use is convincing clients to justify getting radiographs because um, these are only estimations that I can make. But I can use my foot reading skills to, to know that I have this since I know I have a thin sole here and this foot looks so dang long, I also know that I probably have a very deep CE. So I can put all that together in my mind and think when I walk up to this foot and without a rated growth graph, estimate that I probably don't have a lot of changes to make it the heels, that this horse would be better off with a thicker sole, that I could grow a better connected wall that I would be better off to reverse the CE, okay? That, 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 that this, that's what I'm trying to achieve for you, that you're going to walk up, I'm pointing with my finger, that you're going to walk up to this foot and you're going to know that, that, that you've got this to do rather than cutting anything off the bottom of the foot, okay? And then this one, of course, the worst one that maybe, you know, because this one would probably have, you know, an inch and a quarter collateral groove depth here, but then still too shallow here. So that, you know, you might just have that little corner I showed you in the front to do right here as well, okay? Tomorrow we're gonna to talk about how to do all this stuff and some of the pitfalls we get into while trying to do that, okay? And so again, we're gonna we're going to go into the question answer session after a little break, but, I want to try to stick to questions only about what we talked about today. These principles and ideals, basically about the foot reading and about the condition of hoof capsule rotation and about vertical sinking or proximal displacement of the coronet or distal descent, whatever you want to call that. So those are the subjects I want to take questions about. And for today, I want to avoid questions on every other subject. So um, let's uh, take a break until right now I have um, 12.55 Eastern time. So you make those adjustments. So I'm going to take a 15 minute break. So 10 minutes after one Eastern time or 10 minutes after the hour, 15 minutes from now we'll begin a question answer session.
Okay, thank you, Pete. All right, Janine. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Would you like to? No, actually, I want to keep control. I'll just get my my photo. I'll do all okay, this. Everybody I want to can still see your screen. Yeah, I want to be able to go access slides to access people's questions if I need to. Okay. So I'll just keep my screen, but I'm going to try to actually go go potty. Um, I, I I answered all my own questions. I can blow this up for myself so I can see people. Still says you're the only one talking. When I put it on, are you still there, Janine? Yes. When I put it on who's talking, it just stays you all the time. Can you try muting? Can you try muting your microphone? Uh, it muted quickly. Okay, now it's muted. And it still shows only you talking. You have a setup that makes you the presenter all the time and you and you're in control somehow so can you see if you can change that because i would prefer because i want to put it on the view that i have the window that shows who's talking simply because when i put it on everyone i've got this huge screen and i'm real tiny and i want to be able to see myself Because when I go to whiteboard, if I go to whiteboard, the reason for that, if I go to whiteboard or if I'm making hand motions, I want to be able to see what that looks like. Okay, I'm trying to figure out if there is a way to do that. As far as I know, there isn't. Uh, Ruthie, if you're still on, do you know how to do that? Sorry, what were you asking, Janine? Pete, can you rephrase your question so Ruthie can hear you? Okay, for some reason, lot. I'm trying to make it view who's talking, and okay. instead, and it says who's talking. I've got text that says that I'm talking, but it's the view. The camera shows only Janine's all the time, whether she's talking or not, whether she has muted her microphone or not. Is your camera on, Pete? Yes. Um. Well, on some versions of GoToMeeting, I'm, I'm actually on an iPad at the moment, you can specifically um, indicate who you want to show up when they're talking. In other words, it will show you the person who's talking only, and for the presentation, that's usually you the whole time. Does that work for you? Well, the problem is right now I've got RTK is talking, or I did, but that's only me. Jimmy Fitcher. No, wait, it changed. Wait, now it changed. Janine, whatever you did, no, wait, it says R. I'm going to be uh, quiet. What does it say now? Ruthie, yeah. Yep. Okay, now it's working right. My okay, video. I'm moving um, my mouse over people's names. Now I have my mouse over Ruthie. What does that do? No, now it's working right. Now it's saying who's talking. All right, and what about now? Oh, now it's only staying on you. And what about now? Well, let's see if I'll talk. Actually, Ruthie, you talk. It's okay. Still you. Well, I can talk, but of course, I want my microphone off while you're talking. But until we work this out, changes to an R. When I talk, it stays on Ruthie. So it's only not doing it for me. It's doing it for everybody else. That's very strange. <laughs> it doesn't like you. <laughs> I did. I had to log back on because my be internet quit. Time. So. Computers usually explode when I get around them. <laughs> You're doing great, Pete. It's been perfect so far. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there haven't been any problems with people um, in the chat box saying they can't hear or see or whatever. So on the attendee view, it's all going smooth. Now, do okay dealing with lag? Yes, nobody said anything about that. And I There's haven't bought any. There's hardly any, and if anyone has it, I would. <laughs> so I'm going to unmute now and go around the corner. Hey, Ruthie, nice to see you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go pee. All right, yeah, you go take your break. Come back in about 10 minutes. All right.
You there, Janine? Yes. We're going to record the question and answer too, right? Yes, it's still on record now. It was never turned off. Oh. Okay. Now I know why I was so stressed. I gave or attempted to give basically the same presentation to ECIR with a 50 minute time crunch. And now I know why I was so stressed out because it was a two hour presentation. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> yeah, so. There's a couple of questions in the chat box if you can see it now. Oh, well, I have that technology. It'll take me a minute. Give me a second. <laughs> You're not going to read them to me? I can. Uh, I can do it this way. But I thought you were sorting through them. Yeah, they start at 12.52 on the timeline, if you look at that. Wow. Okay. You know, it still shows you instead of me to myself. I can't see myself, which is really only important if I start trying to do whiteboard stuff or real hand motiony stuff. I'd really like to be able to see myself. Yeah, that's something on your end. There should be a, that, like I was saying the other day, that gray bar that you you pull over and slide because um, you're on a computer. You're not on a tablet. Yeah. It's okay. I can put it on view everyone and I see myself. It's just a tiny, tiny little thing because I'm looking at the little blank screen for everyone. Right, but uh, that's where you can slide works. that bar down. See the it's little good. gray bar next to it with a in the center, very center of it, there's a gray dot. You still have that on the left or do you have it on the top? Is your camera showing on the left of your screen? Because if you put your mouse in the proper line, it'll turn into that stretch looking icon where you can stretch things. Yeah, to I it. have that. Right. So if you pull that whatever direction, I don't know where your your screens are set up. Like for me, I have everybody on the top. So if I pull it down, you'll get bigger. Right now, you're a tiny little thumbnail. But now I pulled it down and you you got bigger. It's all right. I'm going to adapt and move on. Okay. Um, well, it. it you want to look at the or you want me to read them? Right now. Go ahead. Do you want me to read the questions, or do you want to scroll through? No, I'll handle it. I can see that you are just kind of wimping out and don't want to do that. No, I'll do it. I just as people keep <laughs> typing new I'm ones, playing, it moves. I'm playing with you. I'm. I'm happy. To. <laughs> yeah, when somebody uh, types in a new one, it'll move. So then you have to re-scroll back. So just be prepared for that. All right, but no one can see all my little pop-up windows, right? Is no, everyone just looking at my... no. Nope, all uh, we see is your PowerPoint looking screen. Okay. And the first question is back at 12.52 from Meg. Okay, I'm getting there. Meg. <clears throat> hey, Meg. <clears throat> I've been told by vets. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it does move. I've been told <laughs> by vets and barriers that leaving folded bar will cause bruising and abscesses. My theory is that the bruise occurred and the horse reacts by laying down excess bar in an attempt to protect the injured area. And then perhaps an abscess from the bruise occurs later. What do you think? I agree with you, Meg. Um, I have seen problems with um, when bars from bruising, when bars are laid out on top of the sole that I felt like caused problems, but within a confine of keeping the bar trimmed to the sole and not keeping on going. I absolutely would disagree with anyone said that said that causes a bruise to the corium. Um, correlation does not 
necessarily equal causation is the the key thing there and i'll go along with you we also have the chicken and egg thing was it bruised and there was a trouble that then is what caused the distorted growth of the bar okay so um, uh, for whatever reason i think that it is basically always a mistake to thin the bar beyond its natural thickness which is somewhere around in a half inch thick of corium if someone if there was a need to trim deeper there um, it needs to be treated as a surgery and done in surgical conditions with surgical aftercare in my opinion you can hit me again if i didn't answer your question and i'm scrolling okay rtk Hey Ruthie, I miss you too. The protective bar ridge at the collateral groove on an otherwise thin soled horse. Okay to continue knocking that back just enough to keep it from being a pressure point. It always grows back, but it's super pointy on this 20 year old thoroughbred, 28 year old thoroughbred. Um, I think that it is probably always you know how i hate that word i think that it is probably always a mistake to trim the ridge along the side of the frog if doing so yields less than a quarter of an inch of straight drop off to the collateral groove if you if it's growing to a half inch of height of ridge it may be appropriate to knock it down to a quarter of an inch, each trim of height above the collateral groove. But in my view, when it gets a quarter of an inch tall relative to the collateral groove, you have just then reached adequate sole thickness in that region. <clears throat> Personally, I'm worried about a, uh, about a pressure point everywhere else where there's a thin sole more than I am in that spot. That said, it may be that what that horse needs is more protection of the entire bottom of the foot. Because um, I don't think that you're ever going to achieve adequate sole thickness in the outer periphery if you're finding the horse feels better to take that ridge down, you know, all the way to the collateral groove adjacent to the frog. So I think the, that you should leave that ridge at least a quarter of an inch tall along the edge of the frog and around the apex of the frog and then provide more protection if needed. That may mean booting, that may mean hoof armor, that may mean um, a different turnout paddock that's more yielding. Um, I just can't at this point in my life think of a scenario that <clears throat> that I would intentionally cut that area of the sole from half an inch thick to three eighths of an inch thick. I'm just, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to find a way around it. The biggest reason for that, even if that made the horse feel better right then, is because I think that will keep me from achieving adequate sole thickness at the rest of the foot. <clears throat> Okay, um, Dennis or Denise, I'm sorry, D-E-N-Y-S, I don't know what to do with that. Um, apologies. Um, how often do I see a, a need to use venograms in synchro cases? I know rads are a lifesaver, but what about venograms? Thank you. Um, The venograms are somewhat useful, um, but I think can be misleading at the same time. Um, I have exactly one vet um, in my area, which that's enough that, that, that's doing them. 
Um, and but I've only requested venograms twice. Both of those were to evaluate around um, the keratomas. Um, um, neither was about the coronet. Um, the reason that I'm suspicious of information that I get from venograms is that they are a window of the blood not circulating, if that makes sense, because the horse is standing still, strike one, and the horse has a very, very tight tourniquet around on top of the fetlock joint. And if that tourniquet is not tight enough and not strong enough, the radiopaque median immediately disappears. Where did it go? It circulated. Okay, so again, the venogram is a is is not a a view of circulation. It's a view of not circulation. If that makes sense. Still, that said, they were very important um, before me and Dr. Taylor met. Um, I was noticing a huge difference in my ability to rehabilitate horses that were more than a half inch 12 millimeter CE. If it was somewhere between 12 to 15 millimeter CE, a half inch to five eighths of an inch. If they were less than that, I found that I reversed them very quickly, very easily. If they were more than that, I had trouble. And meanwhile, she was doing a lot of venograms and had noticed there was good circulation through the coronet in cases that were less than 12 to 15 millimeters. And there was disrupted circulation for the, through the coronet if there was more than 12 to 15 millimeters um, um, uh, of, the, of C. So me saying so 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 we so so we were seeing the same thing in different ways, including the venograms. But so I wouldn't say that it's an unuseful tool for this. Um, I think I'm only saying that 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 I haven't brought it into my evaluation of these horses on a routine basis. So I don't know if I sidestepped your question, evaded your question, or answered your question, but that's what I've got on it. Um, I really don't think about them that much day to day, even though I do have a vet in my area, I could readily get them anytime. Um, I want to move on, maybe get back to it later. Um, We'll go ahead and read these. Stavros, I apologize for butchering another name. While explaining about sinkers, you spoke about permanent damage to P3 and the solar corium and the terminal papilla. What about the coronary corium, lateral cartilage, digital cushion, ligaments that get stretched and stored? Can this damage be reversed? Um, I agree um, uh, with, if, with what you're saying there that all of these things can be damaged um, and can, can lead us to unable to reverse some situations to incomplete reversal of other situations. That was just me being incomplete. That is you being more complete in that list. So yeah, I'm with you. Jennifer, I don't know which Jennifer you are. There's some Jennifers that I miss and would love to see, and there's some Jennifers I don't know. So hello either way. In desert hose, when you have tight, dry grooves, is there a solution or a tip to get a better measurement? No. Um, like I say, we could access that collateral groove information by by raping the frog, you don't want to do that, then we'd have a lame horse. We could access that information by, by 
um, soaking the, the, the feed and getting them really wet, but then they would abrade very quickly in a desert environment and cause problems. So we don't want to do that. So we just have to suck it up and not access that information in these hooves. Um, um, and we, we, we have radiographs, um, we have our ability to read the soul. We have, and we usually do have access to the collateral grooves in the front half of the foot. Um, um, we, 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 we have our hairline that we can look at. And now, even though I'm poo-pooing the hairline that it can lie to you, the, the truth is the hairline is accurate when we're thinking about balance anyway, um, um, 90 something percent of the time. But the real problem with using the hairline for balance is that it's almost always inaccurate when the horse has been moving in an imbalanced way or had an imbalanced foot for a long time. One cornet will have been jammed up higher relative to the, to the other lateral cartilage. So it's like the collateral groove, I mean, the hairline for balance is accurate when we don't need it. And it's not accurate when we need it the most. But anyway, all that said, you know, in, in, in desert hooves, I don't know a way around just, just not using that information. Uh, we just have to use other stuff. RTK. Okay, now I'm answering, okay. I'm getting answers to my questions I already asked. Okay, here's a new one. Hey, Amy. I don't miss you. I do. I'm too teasing. Um, please go over the three lines you draw on P3 on lateral radiographs to judge bone loss. My brain isn't computing where you are drawing them and assessing future rehab. Stand by. Leave it to you to ask a hard question. We don't want to start. We got to get this. We got to get all my windows moved out of the way. Actually, I'm just gonna. Stand by. I wasn't ready. Your magic oh. wand is gone. Oh, well, where did it go? Click it again. Okay. Um, one line that I'm looking at is the, the dorsal aspect. Okay. Then I'm looking at this denser line here. And that is the that is the sagittal plane. That is the line that we would see if we slice the foot right down the center. That's our heaviest line that we see in the radiograph. Okay, so that's one line, two lines. That that's the the middle of the coffin bone. Then this more faint line is the outer periphery. And that's if you can see this is this is a cadaver that I've got the coffin bone sticking out the side instead of just sawing it in two. Okay, so that's looking at our outer periphery is this more faint line. So that's the two that I'm looking at. And if they come all the way to a point, then, then I've got minimal bone loss. And also by looking at how far they are apart, I can see exactly how much solar concavity that that one has that that individual coffin bone has. So then if these lines don't come all the way to a point, I know I have bone loss. 
And if they really, really bad don't come to a point, then um, that, 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 that I know that I have a tremendous amount of bone loss. And now this is the slide that shows the, all three lines together at a time that I can just totally visualize where that coffin bone was. And that is line number one is the outer periphery. Line number two is the sagittal plane or what would be, we would be looking at if we took a saw and sawed that hoof straight down the middle, you know, right through the center of the frog from, from the center of the bulbs to the apex of the frogs and right on out the top, a perfect center of the foot. And then this being the dorsal aspect that we would see in the lateral radiograph. Now, all three of those coming together is gonna precisely show, my, show me my bone loss. So, Type in the chat if I answered your question adequately and I'll see it when I make it down there. Okay, Denise or Dennis, D-E-N-Y-S, did a smiley face, so I guess they were happy with that. Cynthia M, I missed the earlier part of the presentation, so wondering, oh, never mind, that's for Janine. Jean, Jean, you want to answer that now? When will the recording be available to view? Yes, the computer needs to process it, so it'll be ready sometime tonight or tomorrow. I will be sending an email tomorrow with the link for tomorrow's ver uh, part two, and you'll also get a separate link with the recordings for each. It just depends on how long it takes the computer to process the recordings through GoToMeeting but everybody gets it. And if you know anybody who wants to watch it, it's still available for purchase if they go into the past event on the calendar page for PHCP. Okay, good. All right. Um, Amy, and how to use those lines to see potential concavity shape and depth. I may have answered that adequately. I'm not sure. But maybe soul depth. But going back here, um, if this was a flat coffin bone that had very little concavity to it, um, then these lines would be very close together. If I have, if I don't have bone remodeling, they're still going to come all the way to a point. Okay. If I had a deeper, really, really deeply concave coffin bone, then on this end the lines will be further apart. I'd be able to see a deeper concavity to this bone. Okay. Um, and and so whether or not they come to a point tells me if I have a full coffin bone. And whether or not and how far apart the lines are tell me the whole point. How that relates to the soul is how we have to do this. We have to just imagine our where our corium is. Sometimes we can see that clearly, sometimes we can't. Um, but you know it's generally a quarter of an inch -ish thick, you know, surrounding the bone that we can assume that it's there. And and our soul is being projected this way forward okay so so that's how we're going to relate that thickness when we have adequate soul thickness um, and uniform soul thickness our shape of our soul should parallel or at least this you have to understand that this is a cross section of the soul as well this is an is the very very center of the soul right in front of the apex of the frog this tells us nothing about how much soul there is at the quarters. This is the same thing as what this red line is in the bone. It's if we saw the foot right down the middle, bone and all, this is the one spot of soul we'd be able to see. But in that spot, we'd be able to see exactly how much soul thickness we have. And, so, and if we had an adequate soul, it would be paralleling that part of the bone that is corresponding to, and so it'll be that same amount of concavity. But the complex part is we have to think about this 3D. 
that's only the, the shape of the bone in that one spot right at the center. That's only the shape of the sole in that one spot right at the center. We would either have to take pyramid of, of radiographs all the way around or just look at the sole and guess what that shape is and what that bone is everywhere else besides that one spot and and tell me tell me if I answered that question on down lower when I get there Okay, Alicia, thank you for your updating here. For those interested, the founder mini example with distal descent is rehabbed and comfortable and has much shorter feet in a healthier way. <laughs> I mean, you didn't cut the bone with good healthy concavity. I wish I could attach pictures here, but I did a Facebook post with a recent photo. Okay, Alicia, thank you for that. Um, and would you do me a favor in case uh, um, I just granted you a favor the other day. I'm going to ask for payback right here, right now. Um, would you send me those pictures and radiographs? You've got them um, to my email so that in case I ever use this slideshow presentation again in some way, I can include those updates because that would be very useful. Uh, thank you. I'm glad that turned out well. That was hats off to you. That was um, that was not one I would sure would turn out well. Uh, so good job. Jennifer, thank you. And can I do more of these? Um, ah. Um, I don't know. Uh, in theory, maybe I can do more. Um, the problem is, and I told when, when Leslie first contacted me and asked me to teach, um, I told her that I did not have time to make a new presentation, but that I had this one that I felt like I hadn't given because I made this for ECR. I actually made an earlier version for the American Fairs Association and ECIR at the same time. But I did the American Fairs Association version live right at, you know, COVID zero day, March, 2020. And then ECIR was canceled and I gave it later last year as, um, but both of them had a 50 minute time crunch, which, you just saw it took me two hours to do. So I, did, I didn't feel like I'd ever really given this presentation right and adequately. So I told Leslie back then that I would ha be happy. Actually, I really appreciate the opportunity to get to give this presentation right um, without trying to squeeze it into 50 minutes because um, I felt like I was having to hit everything too hard, fast, and in a hurry. And of course, there was a lot of slides that I had to, to delete um, that I felt were making things more clear. So I told her back then, I, I have time to give a presentation, but I don't have time to make a new one. And so I'm kind of really still in that same boat. Um, could I pop up and give a presentation on a, on a random day? Yeah, but could I prepare anything? I couldn't. What what happened with me with COVID is when COVID wiped out, or prior to COVID, COVID wiping out our clinic schedule, um, I was taking care of a lot less horses. I dropped my horses down to less than 100 horses and was basically my trimming income. We were being supported by our clinics. And COVID wiped out the clinics and I upped my number of horses I'm taking care of to, you know, over 300. And now I don't have, I don't have any time to do stuff like this. And so um, uh, I, I, at some point when I raised this current group of kids, which um, 
I've got a, a, a eighth grader as my youngest kid. We're going to go back to doing clinics and teaching and stuff full time. And but until then, right now, um, I'm supporting my family with trimming income only like the rest of you are, I guess. And so you understand, I just I don't have time to uh, to put together presentations. So that's what I'm happy to help PHCP. I just I'm very limited in the time. So given that y'all come up with an idea and maybe I can accommodate you if I can. Uh, but that's what I can do versus what I can't do. Amy Deal, oh, the CE stretch. You said last indicated could be a last rehab. What did you see that indicated it could reverse quickly versus longer rehab? Um, basically, if you look at a digital radiograph and it's of good enough quality that you can see the, the, the proximal end of the inside of the hoof wall, the, 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 this, oh, you still got this, that, that you can see in this one, you can kind of see the shadow, see the, the proximal end of the hoof wall. If that's where it's supposed to be in this niche, which this one is probably a little thicker than it should be. It's not off. It's probably a little further up than it should be, but but it's um uh, if, if that's nice and tight, like if that was settled in right here, it's going to go really quick. But you might have a coronet that's distorted way up here like this, that's stretched out long, and have a deep CE, but you've had minimal or no change down here. Those are going to reverse very easily. But if you can see this, and and the proximal end of the hoof wall and it's migrated way up here you're not going to reverse it and or if you do reverse it you're on the five-year plan um just chill you can have a comfortable horse these horses can be okay ish um they may abscess twice a year they you may have a crap white line um you, that you can't fix you might have you know, flare in the lower inch, you just can't, you, you might have little issues, <clears throat> but you can have a comfortable horse, but you're not just going to quickly reverse it. And so that's totally trying to judge, to answer your question, totally trying to judge this relationship is, did you stretch and distort the coronary papilla? Or are they still sitting here? Not, you know, they should be sitting here kind of like this with a nice steep hoof wall, nice little puffy coronary papilla and the details of this and might yield to Paige. I know y'all have got a, um, a, uh, a webinar coming up with Paige as well that, that I might yield that to her. She's seen so much more dissections uh, than she understands this so much better than I do. This might actually be a better question for her. Um, Thanks a lot, help, it's good to know. Because again, you know, I do, somebody, one of y'all telling me that this helped, that helps me a lot because I do, every time I'm teaching, especially to PHCP, uh, um, I just feel like I'm preaching to the choir and I'm not teaching you anything. So uh, it's really nice to hear that, 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 that this helps somebody, it's good. Especially Amy. Our Amy was one of the smart old ones. Um, so, Amy, if I helped you with a concept, then 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 that makes me feel real good. Okay. Alicia, you're gonna send me pictures. Thank you very much. And so much, uh, Kathy, Latin Decker, I guess saw both um, better than the ECRR version. I, I, I certainly am happier with it myself because, like I say, that, that the ECR version, I tried to give the same talk in 50 minutes that actually took me two hours to do comfortably and without a time constraint. So, so, um, 
again, I thank PHCP for the opportunity because I had put hundreds, an embarrassing amount of time into how long it took me to put this together and didn't feel like I'd ever given it yet. And Amy Deal still asking is that, so if the niche is still tight, I guess that means if we still have um, um, this corner in the right spot, um, then that means to me that, that we haven't had a lot of distortion of the coronary papilla. Um, and we haven't had the dermal lamina stretched up to halfway up P, P2. So from that concept alone, everything should be much easier, although there might be other problems, but that's one problem you don't have. Sasha Hunter. Thank you, wonderful first set of radiographs for a Mustang. Okay, I'm gonna skip some of this. You've mentioned that you don't worry about the degree of rotation. Can you generalize what you feel is a minimal rotation versus significant rotation in degrees? Um, what I find out in the real world is that how much rotation there is, it's how much hoof capsule rotation or how far the hoof is deviated from the coffin bone um, doesn't affect my rehab prospects. Um, if there's been laminitis, the laminitis have been weakened so are more easily separated when certain mechanics are put to them. Um, if the if the if this is a SERS event where the, the lamina have been destroyed or laminitis is very bad or prolonged, then we can have complete destruction of lamellar connection. But if you and if you have bad forces applied, the trimming neglect, um, uh, bad trimming, uh, bad you know you know uh, uh, bad forces, the way the horse impacts loads. You can have tremendous amount of displacement of the bone, but you can have that same amount of damage to the actual lamina. But if you have better mechanics in place, if you've got somebody that's been keeping the walls passive and the horse has been solar loaded, um, or sometimes if the horse has been shod back to back, the shoe can hold the hoof wall together. And so, you know, you can have just zero lamellar integrity top to bottom, but everything getting held in a tight package. Um, so there's all kinds of variables to the, the mechanics that can be in place with the same really bad um, destruction of the lamina. But the flip of that, you can have a lot of these same, lot, a little bit of rotation or a lot of rotation based on minimal real nutritional problems just by the mechanical problems or you know health problems so so um the amount of rotation doesn't tell me much medically it tells me stuff mechanically um so if i see a 30 degree rotation that may be easier to rehabilitate than a three degree rotation or a horse with no rotation because of other things that are that are in play. Um, um, either way, you may have nutritional issues that may or may not be corrected. Either way, you may have medical issues that, that can or cannot be corrected or may or may not, the, the client may be willing or unwilling to correct them. Um, um, dot, 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 the list goes on. Um, so what I am looking for is 
how long this has been going on, how much corium damage, how much internal damage there is. The best window into that is how much bone remodeling there is. Now, bone remodeling doesn't cause a lot of problems in itself. It causes some if you've lost the outer periphery of the bone so that the coffin bone has no depth. That horse is going to be flat footed for the rest of its life, no matter what you do. Um, and so, the, or at least no matter what reasonable thing you do. Um, if there's a ski tip on the coffin bone, you can't grow a perfect lamellar connection all the way down. At some point, it has to come loose and come around the ski tip. So, bone remodeling does affect what you can grow in those ways physically. But the biggest thing is, is that bone remodeling has a very strong tendency to correlate with corium damage. But I don't think one causes the other. I think they're both present because of the same causes. So when you have bone loss, um, bone remodeling, there's a very strong tendency to be weak lamina, um, the, uh, the, that you'll just never quite grow out all of the wall flare, no matter what you do nutritionally. Um, there'll tend to be, they'll tend to be a slow sole grower. You may not be able to ever achieve an adequately thick sole in some, in others, you can do it by using hoof armor um, or, you know, other ways of protecting the sole for a period while you build adequate sole thickness. Um, so those are bigger indicators than the rotation itself. Um, so I guess to answer your question, no. Um, it's like I say, I've seen, I've seen hopeless laminitic cases with the hoof wall parallel with the coffin bone, and I've seen easily fixable 30 degree rotations and everything in between. Um, so again, I don't know if I answered your question or skillfully sidestepped it, but that's about the best I've got. Uh, everybody's just bragging on me now. I, uh, they really didn't need all that, but thanks. We got to a question. This one's from James. Um, This is long, so I'm, I'm reading it to myself first. No photos or radiographs, so it might be hard. Yes, it will be. There was a senior small medium pony, 30 years old, PPID and no teeth. At a barn, uh, just stop right there. <laughs> oh. Three years old, PPID, no teeth. No matter what you've done, it's probably good. And no matter what you've done, well, probably you're never going to fix this guy. Okay, but I'll carry on. At a barn where I groom part time while working on starting my business, he foundered about the time I started there. 17 degree rotation. Okay, I'll answer this in parts. One, he's talking about going and seeing the farrier. Um, is a farrier putting on shoes and pads and carving out, uh, uh, cutting a lot of sole, aggressively carving out, grows a ton of sole. Um, 
Um, my gut and training is saying there's no way the pony was what was has even adequate soul, and is trying desperately to lay down more because this guy takes away everything he manages to grow in an attempt to create concavity. Okay, uh, let me stop right there. It keeps going, but I, I, I'll, I'll pick it up. But to answer your question so far, the amount of soul someone is coming cutting off tells me nothing. The a, a symptom of some laminate laminated courses is radical fast growth of hoof wall, sole, bar, frog. A symptom of some laminated courses is very, very slow growth of all of these. I have seen examples of horses that needed huge trims to everything um, at every trim. So you basically would have to show me pre and post trim radiographs um, for me to have any idea, for, for me to know for sure whether he was doing exactly what needed to be done or was hurting the horse or anywhere in between. Um, if you showed me pictures with collateral groove measurements before and after each trim, I would have a good guess um, of the same. Uh, uh, that'd be that'd be it, the best I could do. But cutting lots of stuff off is sometimes very very appropriate. In fact, those are my very very favorite days ever. Is when I get to to throw buckets full of stuff over my shoulder. Now, is it rare? To have to do that repeatedly yeah it happens though but it's pretty rare usually i do it as one big setup trim and everything else i do afterwards is pretty subtle And that was it. I, that, I'm sorry, James, but that's the best I can answer your question with the information provided. Okay. Oh, is that the end? All right, that's the end. Okay. But Sasha Hunter sends another one. Sasha, radiographs and photographs of the Mustang's feet. Is that something that I could share with you? Um, I'm going to have to say no. I'm going to refer the looking at pictures and stuff to the um, PHCP forum um, and go ahead and close today. Sorry. Um, but that is a monster, monster can of worms that, 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 that I don't want to open right now. So um, thanks, everyone. And I'll see you same time tomorrow. Yes, thank you, Pete. And again, everybody, I'll be sending out the links for the recording later. Oh, here goes the cuckoo. Um, I'll be sending out the links later for the recording. So see you all tomorrow.